Good morning. For those of you who do not know me, I'm John Thornton, the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Brookings Institution. Uh, nothing makes me happier having spent the last 10 years of my life on U.S.-China relations than to see a room like this with Americans and Chinese together helping to solve a, a difficult problem in both countries. So I welcome you very warmly to the institution this morning. I have a few opening remarks, then I'm going to turn it over to our distinguished guests. Now, there are so many important people in the audience, I'm reluctant to recognize any of them, but I do want to recognize former Prime Minister Julia Gillard and welcome you. It's nice to be in a room where the most important people in the room are all women. <laughs> Science has left little doubt that what happens in the earliest years of, child, of a child's life matters immensely in shaping the rest of that life. Early childhood development, or ECD, also has disproportionate influence on the potential of our communities and indeed our countries. ECD is high on the priority list for both the US and China. As such, there should be a great deal of mutual learning that can take place. At Brookings, for instance, we have begun a program that aims to fill the gaps in knowledge about what it takes to scale up ECD in developing countries. We are eager to learn from China's experience and expertise for insights that can be applied in the United States and elsewhere. To help us address this literally life-changing subject, we have with us today two of China and America's most distinguished leaders. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Vice Premier Liu Yongdong for a number of years. The Vice Premier has taken an interest in early childhood development issues throughout her career. As chairperson of the All-China Youth Federation in the late 1980s, for instance, she established Project HOPE, a charity that has constructed tens of thousands of elementary schools in China's poorest regions. As vice premier and a member of the Politburo of the 18th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, Madam Liu honors us today by being the most senior Chinese official to ever speak at Brookings. Secretary Clinton, one of the world's most eminent leaders, requires no introduction to this or any audience. Since leaving government, she has been deeply involved in the Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton Foundation, which keeps her engaged in global and domestic issues. As we began planning today's event, it was obvious that Secretary Clinton was the ideal and natural person to represent the US side, given her longstanding involvement with China and with children's issues. Another reason is her relationship with Vice Premier Liu. They've done much, much important work together. As many of you will know, in 2010, Secretary Clinton and Vice Premier Liu founded the Chinese-U.S. high-level consultation on people-to-people -people exchanges. They co-chaired three rounds of the consultations in Beijing and Washington, launching cooperative programs in education, science and technology, culture, and sports. Indeed, the official part of Vice Premier Liu's visit to Washington this time is, in fact, to continue this important initiative with her new counterpart, Secretary Kerry. Finally, a word about our co-hosts. The China Development Research Foundation is one of China's most important and influential research institutions, and we were delighted when its Secretary General, Professor Lu Mai, sitting right over here, suggested uh, a joint event. We share a strong belief that there needs to be more exchange of views and genuine research collaboration between U.S. and Chinese think tanks. Brookings is committed to doing its part. In addition to this public event this morning, we will hold discussions between Brookings scholars and the CDRF delegation this afternoon about future areas for cooperation. Now, just a few logistical comments. In a minute, I'm going to turn the podium over to Vice Premier Liu, who will make some remarks, followed by Secretary Clinton. I will then take the prerogative of the chair, ask each one of them uh, one question on behalf of all of us. If the audience could then remain seated, while we allow the uh, Vice Premier and the Secretary to depart. Well, then there'll be a break of 10 minutes and then we'll continue the program. Please welcome uh, Vice Premier Liu Yongdong. Thank you. 
，希拉里·克林顿女士啊，尊敬的约翰·桑顿主席啊，也感谢刚才桑顿主席啊啊所说的那番非常热情的话。女士们、先生们，大家早上好，很高兴呢，来到久负盛名的布鲁金斯学会，参加中美儿童早期发展战略的对话会。嗯、我知道。拥有近百年历史的布鲁金斯学会是全球智库中的佼佼者。啊，不仅你们出思路，而且出人才，被称为没有学生的大学。历届美国政府呢，都有不少重要的人员啊来自这里。这次贵会与中国发展研究基金会。就儿童的早期发展进行对话交流，是富有爱心、深见、深有远见的一个行动。我对会议的召开表示祝贺，也并期望着对话呢能够取得丰硕的成果。儿童是家庭幸福所系，国家希望所在。三年前，啊，时任美国国务卿的克林顿女士访华时，送给我一本名为《举全村之力》的书，讲的就是应该动员地球村所有人的力量，帮助所有的孩子能够健康。快乐、活泼的成长。克伦顿女士本人还是儿童营养一千天理念的积极倡导者和实践者。同为人母，我对此呢也是深有同感的。因为中国呢是一个发展中国家，人均 GDP 还排在啊世界的第八十六位。按联合国标准，还有一点二八亿贫困人口。五年前呢，我曾经到贵州和宁夏的山区考察，看到一些孩子因离家太远，不能及时吃上饭。有的贫困家庭的孩子呢，因为营养缺乏而长得很瘦弱，心情呢十分的沉重。我和同事们马上进行了专题研究。中国政府呢，在集中连片的贫困地区六百八十个县实施了营养改善计划，如今呢，已汇集到三千一百多万学生。如此大规模的营养干预行动，在中国历史上还是头一次、啊，因此呢，也得到了世界银行、联合国开发计划署和儿童伙伴组织专家们的高度评价。中国呢，还实施了贫困地区儿童营养的改善项目和消除婴幼儿的贫血行动，分别使一百个特殊贫困县和七十三个国家级贫困县，大约八十万的婴儿受益。最近呢，啊，也就是我回国以后，也即将颁布国家贫困地区儿童的发展规划。准备出台一系列的全程干预、全面保障的政策措施，为贫困地区的孩子送去更多的关爱。我们的目的就是要筑底，啊，筑牢网底的安全网。啊，筑筑牢兜底的安全网，让每一个孩子啊都能够健康的成长。女士们、先生们，中国省政府呢，始终还是高度的重视儿童发展事业，千方百计的为少年儿童的学习成长。创造更好的条件。近年来呢，中国坚持儿童优先的原则，啊，制定了面向二零二零年的妇女儿童发展规划，与经济社会发展同步规划、同步实施、同步提升，推动儿童发展事业取得了显著的成绩。一个就是儿童的健康状况呢，持续的改善。我们加强基层的妇幼卫生的服务网络的建设，实施免费的孕前优生健健康的检查，降低孕产妇和新生儿的死亡等项目。而且国家呢的免疫规划基本实现城乡儿童的全覆盖，婴儿的死亡率。五岁以下的儿童死亡率分别由十年前的
百分之千分之三十二点二，千分之三十九点七，下降到千分之十，千分之十三。可以说是提前实现了联合国千年发展的相关的目标。二是儿童受教育的机会更加公平。我们实施学前教育三年行动计划，学前三年的毛入园率由零九年的百分之五十点九提高到二零一二年的百分之六十四点五。全面实现了城乡九年义务制的免费的教育，男女童的小学进入学历达到了百分之九十九以上，而且还保障了近一千四百万的进城务工的人员随迁子女接受义务教育。我们在农村建设了八千多所寄宿制学校。完善留守儿童的教育监护网络，还通过教育救助的政策，使将近四十万的残疾儿童平等的享有受教育的权利。三是儿童的法律保护日趋健全。中国目前已经形成了以《未成年人保护法》为主体，《义务教育法》《母婴保健法》等相关法律相配套的、比较完密的、啊严密的法律体系。因此呢，全社会保护儿童的法律意识呢，也是明显的增强。司法机构和法律援助的网络也在不断的健全。四是儿童成长环境。进一步优化。我们构建了学校、家庭、社会三位一体的教育网络，加强儿童的安全保障制度建设，未成年孤儿的养育、教育、医疗、康复和住房，全部由财政负担。残疾儿童、流浪儿童、艾滋病影响儿童等弱势儿童呢，也得到了更多的关怀和救助。女士们、先生们，八天前。Ladies and gentlemen, we thought in the 18th Central Committee of the Congress of China was concluded just eight years ago. At the meeting, a roadmap was drawn up to deepen comprehensive reform in China in the next several years, which demonstrates to the whole world our resolve to deepen reform, expand opening up, and pursue development, peaceful development. In particular, the plenum calls for making greater efforts to ensure and improve people's well-being and promote social equity and justice. It stresses the need to advance reform and development of preschool education and special education and to provide adequate education to every student. I believe all this will create a better social environment for the development of children. There are almost 300 reform measures which cover 15 aspects and 60 areas in the decision adopted at the plenum, which puts the protection of children an important part. And this has made it a mandatory target that we need to achieve by 2020. There are in China close to 310 million children. And young people below the age of 18 to further promote children's development in a big developing country like China is a daunting challenge. In the course of promoting children's development, one thing we have learned is that investment in early childhood development is a human capital investment with the highest return. So the earlier and more such investment is made, the better. We should give priority to meeting children's needs and making laws and policies and allocating public resources. Fiscal education and health are two main areas of advancing children's development. 
Therefore, we should pursue a policy of children's development with such a focus and lay a solid foundation for the lifelong development of everyone. The growth of children is governed by its own laws. We must carefully study these laws, respect them, respect the children, and help them develop in an all-round and distinctive way. At the same time, the whole society should care about the growth of children. We must give full play to the roles of the government, schools, communities, the media, and non-profit organizations, so that care for the children will become an integral part of national consciousness, civic code of conduct, and social morale. As an old Chinese saying goes, education in the early stage is vital to one's advancement in the whole life. Children's development will continue to be a strategic priority for the Chinese government. We will draw on best practices of other countries and explore a path of promoting children's development in keeping with China's national conditions so as to prevent poverty from being passed on to the next generation and gain rich human resources and human capital for the future. We will strive to uphold children's rights, increase their well-being, and promote their all-round development so that each and every child will have the opportunity to realize his or her dream and enjoy an even brighter future. Ladies and gentlemen, I am visiting the United States to implement the important agreement reached by our two presidents and co-chair the first high-level consultation on people-to-people -people exchange following the change of government in both countries. And this mechanism was established according to the agreements of our two countries and built with the personal efforts of Madam Clinton and I. Since the launch of this mechanism four years ago, our two countries have actively promoted extensive and substantive exchanges in areas such as education, science and technology, culture, sports, women and young people. This has opened a new chapter in promoting mutual understanding and exchanges between the two peoples, and it has become a good example of people-to-people -people exchanges between China and other countries. Here, I wish to once again pay respect to Madam Clinton, the co-founder of this mechanism. To raise public awareness of child protection and create an enabling environment for their growth has increasingly become a consensus of the international community. Chinese President Xi Jinping attaches great importance to early childhood development. He has pointed out that the development potential of mankind rests on the children, and their healthy growth hinges on the care and efforts of all governments and the whole international community. In the State of the Union this year, President Obama also called for providing high-quality preschool education to every child in the United States. Despite different national conditions, China and the United States share the vision and goal of giving priority to children and promoting social fairness and there is broad space for boosting our cooperation in this field. By making early childhood education an important part of our people-to-people -people exchange and enhancing our communication and dialogue in this area, we will not only bring benefit to Chinese and American children, but also provide useful experience for other countries. I hope we will, in the spirit of respecting each other and seeking common ground while setting aside differences, build a dialogue platform and expand communication channels to jointly discuss concepts, ways and policies for promoting children's development. I also hope Chinese and American scholars and research institutions will launch joint studies on frontier issues in early childhood development to deepen theoretical understanding, study and practice in this area. It is also my hope that research institutions can play a bigger role in this area. For example, Mr. Lu Mai once visited the poorest areas of China, such as Yunnan, Guizhou, to do an experiment on child nutrition. 
And our plan to improve the nutrition of children in poor areas is also the result of the joint study of many scholars. And President Xi Jinping has personally pointed out that we should do a good job in this area. I hope more non-government organizations, research institutions, schools, and people from various sectors will take part in this endeavor to build strong synergy for improving children's development and deepening our people-to-people exchanges. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the determined efforts made by one generation of Americans after another to pursue their dreams that made today's innovative, dynamic, and modern America possible. The Chinese people also have their dream, which is to bring prosperity to our country, renewal to our nation, and happiness to our people. Children are the future and hope of a country's development. Promoting children's development is a key part in the Chinese dream, the American dream, and the world dream. We sincerely look forward to making more progress through our cordial exchanges and close cooperation so that every child on both sides of the Pacific and children in the whole world will be healthier and happier. And the Chinese dream, American dream, and the world dream will be more fascinating and beautiful. Thank you. Well, I certainly agree that this issue deserves the high-level attention uh, that we are giving to it today. And I am very grateful to the Vice Premier for her eloquent uh, description of what China is doing and her deep understanding of the importance that all countries, all people, all families uh, should place on the early childhood development of our boys and girls. It is a great pleasure for me to be once again uh, with uh, Madam Liu, who I've had the great pleasure of working with uh, on many of these issues that may not be in the headlines, but are in the trend lines. You know, too often we only pay attention to what is on the front pages of the newspapers because those are the crises we have to deal with. But the work that uh, she has described, uh, that she is undertaking in her new responsibility as Vice Premier, looking after the health and well-being of the Chinese people, particularly Chinese children, will, I predict, in history be seen as among the most important commitments that China is making. I am delighted to be here with uh, John Thornton, the chair of the board of Brookings. I'm also delighted to see so many distinguished Chinese friends and former colleagues uh, here today. And I'm particularly pleased to see uh, former Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard, uh, who is working uh, with uh, Brookings. Madam Liu and I have had the opportunity to work closely together and in particular to launch the high-level people-to-people dialogue between our two countries in an effort to foster mutual understanding and respect. She is the highest-ranking woman in the Chinese government. First, she served as state councillor and now as vice premier over the last several years. Uh, and as someone who knows a little bit about how hard it can be to crack those glass ceilings, I applaud uh, her personal uh, prestigious responsibilities, but also her commitment uh, to women and children, uh, which is a shared interest that we both highly value. This cause of early childhood development is close to both our hearts. It is true we are both mothers, and maybe that gives us a particular perspective, 
But it's also because as um, leaders in our respective nations, we have seen how important it is to tend to our very youngest citizens, uh, to ensure that uh, every child uh, has the best opportunity to succeed in school and in life. It is not only the right thing to do, it is the smart thing as well. Investing in early childhood development is one of the best returns on investment that a country can make to accelerate long-term economic growth and productivity. As Secretary of State, I had the great privilege of visiting uh, 112 countries, and I saw firsthand the choices and the investments that various countries were making. Certainly, there is no better investment than in our children. James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, has pioneered research into the broad benefits to society and to economies from early childhood development. Every dollar we invest can yield savings of more than $7 down the road by improving school achievement and graduation rates and reducing social problems such as crime and unemployment. Advances in brain science are also telling us how important these first five years of life are for both individual and social development. Even something as simple as talking or reading or singing to your infant can have a huge impact on the brain development. Again, it is a wonderful way of interacting with and nurturing your child, but we now can see on brain scans, it is actually building brain capacity. Scientists can watch brain synapses and neurons firing when children are being interacted with in a supportive and positive way from literally the minute they are born. When you are talking to an infant, you are teaching an infant. And you're feeding that child's brain to help it grow and to prepare it for the learning that lies ahead in schooling. So it is no surprise to hear that China, focused on sustaining growth and lifting people out of poverty, is investing even more in early childhood development, which includes early childhood nutrition, because you have to also feed the body while you feed the brain in order to produce healthy children, to take on the challenges of the 21st century. Now, there are important discussions underway in the international scientific community about how we include uh, these early childhood brain uh, research findings uh, in our understanding. And that has filtered out to decision makers, both in governments and in the not-for-profit sector, as well as the private sector, uh, to do more to include early childhood development in new global development goals. Uh, we made great progress on the Millennium Development Goals uh, starting in 2000. Uh, China uh, has demonstrated uh, great success, uh, but now we will have a new uh, set of goals coming out of the high-level panel review that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called for. And early childhood should be, and I hope will be, uh, up there with every other uh, important goal to advance human development and alleviate poverty. Because what we have learned is that it's not enough just to put children into school at the age of four or five or six. If they haven't been prepared, if they haven't been given the chance to learn before they ever walk in the school door, they will not realize their potential at the uh, level that we would hope for them. Uh, so we are switching our focus just somewhat from what happens in the classroom, what the expectations are, the outcomes we seek, to understanding we have to better prepare uh, children. I've been interested in this for quite some time because 
Um, as Madam Liu said, there was research done in the United States back in the 1970s that I wrote about in my book, It Takes a Village, that actually counted the words that children heard in their earliest years of life. It would not be a surprise that in families of education, there were more words, which created a cycle of greater opportunities and greater preparation among the children of those families. In middle income, middle class families, there were fewer words, but still many words. In poor families, far fewer words. And the estimates were shocking, that by the time children from each of those three economic and educational groups, which often correlate, certainly in our country, uh, reached kindergarten, the children from the well-educated upper income families had heard 30 million more words than the children from the poor families. So is it any surprise that the vocabularies of the children from families like my husband's and mine were much greater, the understanding of the world around them much more sophisticated, and the ability to learn much greater? So what we are doing at the um, Clinton Foundation is focusing on those early years of life uh, to try to encourage families in particular, but also uh, child care workers, preschool teachers, community uh, support systems, to do more to help uh, children from poorer backgrounds have greater uh, interaction when it comes to brain development through the simplest, cheapest approach of all, helping families do more to interact with their own babies. I've done this work for a long time, as I said, and very often, 30 years or so ago, I would make it a practice when I saw uh, families, particularly young mothers, with their infants or babies or toddlers, uh, and particularly with the infants and the babies, I would say, I bet you're having so much fun talking to your baby. And there would be a look of surprise. And the mother would say, well, why would I talk to her? She can't talk back. And I realized that somehow we had lost the accumulated wisdom and also given the stresses, the economic stresses, the social stresses that so many families around the world face today, uh, that we had to do more to reach out and assist and empower families to be their children's first teachers and to understand the important role that they play. Because the results are so wonderful to see. And I want to end with uh, a story from my experience with uh, Madame Liu. Uh, when I was in Beijing in the spring of 2012 for the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, she and I held a meeting of our people-to-people -people, uh, dialogue in the beautiful National Museum. When our delegation arrived, we were met by a large group of Chinese and American children waving flags and offering greetings. Upstairs, a chorus of Chinese and American students sang two songs of welcome, one in English, the other in Mandarin Chinese. And then finally, two exchange students stepped forward. A very impressive young Chinese woman talked about living in New York, an eye-opening and horizon-expanding uh, experience, and she did it in flawless English. Then an American young man stood up and just as impressively described his studies in China and how it had furthered and deepened his understanding of the relationship between our two countries. I was so proud of both of them, and I think from mother to mother we looked at each other and thought, this is the future we want to see. And we want to see our young people working together, understanding each other, communicating. Yes, will there be differences? Of course, there are between two people, let alone two great countries. But to have the background and the confidence to work through those disagreements peacefully and effectively is our hope. And much of that depends upon the education and the start in life that children in both of our countries have. 
In my four years as secretary, I participated in countless formal meetings and carefully choreographed summits. But every so often, a human moment broke through <laughs> and reminded us why we were all doing this in the first place, being away from our own families to try to help make the world a better place for everyone. That was one of those moments. And listening to those students just reminded me that it was so important what Madam Liu and I were trying to do to strengthen people-to-people -people ties, to do more on educational exchanges, cultural tours, scientific collaboration, and so much else. So I am delighted that Brookings will be uh, working in this important area of early childhood development because I think this is yet another way that we can see cooperation. We can see our researchers working together. We can see our early childhood experts and teachers working together. Uh, and we can build stronger ties starting from the very beginning of life that will send unmistakable signals to our people in both our countries and to the world that we intend to, as I've often said, cross the river together in the same boat, rowing in the same direction for a better world for us all. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay, so my job is to keep everything on time here. I'm going to, as I said earlier, 我现在主要的工作呢是要确保我们的会议能够继续按照预先的日程进行。And I'm going to ask them at the same time so we can move this along. For Secretary Clinton, I'd like to ask the following question. This is a, this is going to sound almost naive in the current Washington, but nevertheless, given the overwhelming evidence about the the benefits of what we've all been describing this morning. Why is it so difficult in our country to get consensus on the scale of public investment into early childhood development? And for Vice Premier Liu, uh, if you could explain to the audience, given the fact that uh, many, if not most, of the children we're talking about are in rural China or the children of migrant workers in, the, in urban China, why the investment in that particular group is so important for China's economic and social future. Secretary Clinton. Well, let, let me start then, John. Um, I think there is a consensus uh, that we need to do more in early childhood development. Uh, there is a debate about the government's role at the federal level, the government's role at the state and local level, uh, the family's role, the private sector's role, and the uh, not-for-profit sector role. Uh, what I am hoping we can do is begin to uh, pull all the various uh, parties together. As Madam Liu said, uh, President Obama called for a greater uh, federal government investment in preschool. Uh, which is very important, something that helps to shore up uh, systems where they exist around the country and create them where they don't. At the same time, a number of states, uh, Oklahoma and Georgia being two of them, have made significant investments in early childhood education. Uh, so this is not a partisan issue. It's a values issue that has budgetary consequences. So what we are hoping for is to make a strong case that uh, there is an opportunity for our federal government, our state and local governments to uh, make uh, a, a commitment to early childhood. The newly elected mayor of New York uh, has made a very explicit commitment. So that's the government side of the equation. And it's incredibly important and it needs to be uh, continually uh, expanded in the right ways. But it's not only about our government, because what I was talking about are the very earliest weeks and months of life, where the first educational experience that a child has is in the family that is responsible for that child. 
And it's my very strong belief that even if we had everything we could dream of for institutional preschool programs around our country tomorrow, we would still be working to make sure that families, particularly families that don't have this information or been given the opportunity to understand what they can do as their child's first teacher, uh, would be doing more. So I think, John, that uh, this has to be elevated as an issue, um, but it needs to be seen not just as a government issue or not just as a family issue, but as an integrated approach to uh, helping our very youngest citizens get the best start in life and giving them the support and services through their families uh, and through uh, communities that they deserve to have. So it's, uh, it's an issue that, because of the brain science now, uh, is catching on uh, and being understood by a much broader uh, population in our own um, government as well as uh, society. Thank you. 我也就是回答一下约翰桑德先生提出的这个问题我想中国的早期儿童的发展在未来的十年里中国进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分之一的人口进入到每年还将有百分
，这个，所以呢，就是也要进行这个正常的营养的干预，啊，使孩子也能够健康的这个成长。啊，但是总之呢，我们将来要把这个流动儿童和留守儿童啊，作为我们下一步儿童早期教育、早期发展的一个重点。同时，最后一点，那我也想，要是通过人文交流机制呢，加强和美国和其他国际社会啊进行这个交流与合作啊，特别是美国在这方面呢，这个很早的时候就开始注重这个问题啊，所以很多东西呢也是中国是可以借鉴的。所以，总之呢，我相信呢，在中国政府的这个大力的努力下啊，现在我们中国的这个教育经费。啊，中国现在有两亿六千万的学生，再加上这个幼儿啊，有将近四千万，是三亿一千万的学生和幼儿，是吧？所以现在中国政府呢，已经把财政投入啊，是教育投入是第一投入，这个占了整个财政国家财政支出的百分之十七点六。而且最近的五年，每年都以百分之十九的速度增长。啊，所以下一步呢，这个包括这次全中央三中全会的决定，仍然把教育放在优先的这个这个位置。啊，所以我觉得有这样一个好的条件。在经过我们的努力工作，啊，还有加强和美国以及其他国家的交流合作，我相信这些问题呢都能得到更加妥善的解决。You know, look forward to partnering with you at Brookings. Obviously, partnering with our uh, Chinese friends uh, in our initiative called "Too Small to Fail," uh, because that is how we uh, think of uh, the challenge that we face. But again, uh, please join me in thanking both Brookings and Madam Liu for this very informative session. <laughs>